Hello and welcome to the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel where we are celebrating the release of Disney Plus's Star Wars The Book of Boba with an audiobook of The Bounty Hunter Wars Book 1, The Mandalorian Armour. A book featuring our boy Boba himself by W.K. Jeter from 1998. Yes, we always love our retro stuff here in the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. Let's begin with Chapter 1. Now, during the events of Star Wars Return of the Jedi. The live ones are worth more than the dead ones. That was the general rule of digital appendage for bounty hunters. Dengar hardly had to remind himself of it as he scanned the bleak and eye-stinging bright wastes of the Dune Sea. Right now, he'd spotted a lot more dead things than living which all added up to a big zero for his own credit accounts. I'd have done better, he told himself, getting off this miserable planet. Tatooine had never been any luckier for him than it had been for any other sentient creature. Some worlds were like that. His luck wasn't as bad as some others had been, Dengar had to admit that. Especially when, as his plastoid sheathed boots had trudged up another sloping flank of sand, a gloved fist had seized on his ankle, toppling him heavily onto his shoulder. What the? His surprised outcry vanished echoless across the dunes, as he rolled onto his back, scrabbling his blaster from its holster. He held his fire, seeing now just what it was that had grabbed onto him. His fall had pulled a hand and arm free from the shifting sands that formed the shallow grave for one of Jabba the Hutt's personal corps of bodyguards. Some reflex wired into the dead warrior's battle glove had snapped the dead hand tight as a womp rat. Dengar reholstered his blaster, then sat up and began peeling the fingers away from his boot. You should have stayed out of it, he said aloud. The dune sea's scouring wind revealed the corpse's empty eye sockets. Like I did. Getting into other creatures' fights was always a bad idea. A whole batch of the galaxy's toughest mercenaries, bounty hunters included, had gone down with the wreckage of Jabba the Hutt's sail barge. If they'd been as smart as they'd been tough, Dengar himself wouldn't have been out here right now, searching for their weapons and any military gear and any other salvageable debris. He got his boot free and stood up. Better luck next time, he told the dead man. His advice was too late to do that one any good. In his own memory bank, Dengar filed away the image of the corpse, with its clawing fingers and mouth full of sand, as further proof of what he'd already known. The guy who comes along after the battle's over is the one who cleans up. In more ways than one. He stood at the top of the dune, shielding his eyes from the glare of Tatooine's double suns, and scanned across the wide declivity in front of him. The forms of other warriors and bodyguards sprawled across the rocky wastes, or half buried like the one left a few meters behind, showed that he'd found the still and silent epicenter of all that fatal action he had so wisely avoided. More evidence bits and pieces of debris, the wreckage of the repulsor lift sail barge that had served as Jabba's floating throne room, lay scattered across the farther dunes. Scraps of the canopy that had shaded Jabba's massive bulk from the midday suns now fluttered in the scolding breezes, blaster fire and the impact of the crash having torn the extensive Sordarian wet fabric to rags. Dengar could see a few more of Jabba's bodyguards, face down on the hot sand, their weapons stolen by scavenging Jawas. They wouldn't be fighting anyone to protect their boss's wobbling bulk. Even in this desiccating heat, Dengar could smell the sickly aftermath of death. It wasn't unfamiliar to him. He'd been working as a bounty hunter and general purpose mercenary long enough to get used to it. But the other scent he'd hoped to catch, that of profit, was still missing. He started down the slope of the dune towards the distant wreckage. There was no sign of Jabba's corpse. 
once Dengar reached the spot. And that didn't surprise him, as he used a broken shanked scythe staff to poke around the rubble. Soon after the battle, he'd seen a Hutti's transport lifting into the sky. That had been what had guided him to the remote spot. The ship, undoubtedly, had had Jabba's body aboard. Huts might be greedy, credit-hungry slugs, a trait Dengar actually admired in them, but they did have a certain feeling toward the members of their own species. Kill one, he knew, and you were in deep nerf waste. It wasn't sentimentality on the part of the other huts, so much as a wound to their notorious megalomania, mixed with a practical self-interest. So much for Luke Skywalker and the rest of them, thought Dengar, as the point of the staff revealed sticky and distasteful evidence of Jabba's death. As if that little band of rebels didn't have enough trouble, with the whole empire gunning for them, now they'd have the late Jabba's extended clan after them as well. Dengar shook his head. He would have thought that Skywalker and his pal Han Solo would have, at least, an appreciation of the hut capacity for bearing grudges. Even without Jabba's obese form rotting under the thermal weight of the suns, the debris zone stank. Dengar lifted a length of chain, the broken metal at its end twisted by blaster fire. The last time he'd seen this hand-forged tether back at Jabba's palace, it had been fashioned to an iron collar around Princess Leia Organa's neck. Now the links were crusted with the dried excudations from Jabba's slobbering mouth. The hut must have died hard, thought Dengar, dropping the chain. A lot to kill there. He'd gotten an account of the fight from a couple of surviving bodyguards that had managed to drag themselves back to the palace. When Dengar had left to come out here to the dune sea wastes, most of the remaining thugs and louts were busy smashing open the casks of off-planet claret in the cool, dank cellars beneath the palace, and getting obliterated in an orgy of relief and self-pity at no longer being Jabba the Hutt's employ. Yeah, you're free too. Dengar picked up an unsmashed food pot that the toe of his boot had uncovered. The still-living delicacy inside one of Jabba's favorite truffleites, scrabbled against the ceramic lid embossed with the distinctive oval seal of Fanark & Co. exotic foodstuffs. We cater to the galaxy's degenerate appetites. For what it's worth. His own taste didn't run to the likes of the pot's spidery, gel-mired contents. He hooked a gloved finger in the lid's air hole and pried it open. The nutrient gases hissed out, they had sustained the delicacy's freshness, all the way from whatever distant planet had spawned it. See how long you last out here. The truffleite dropped to the sand, scrabbled over Dengar's boot, and vanished over the nearest dune. He imagined some Tuscan raider finding the little appetizer out there and being completely perplexed by it. One substantial piece of wreckage remained, too big for the Jawas to have carted away, the hardened durasteel keel beam of the sail barge, blackened by explosions that had destroyed the rest of the craft, rose at an angle from where the stern end was buried beneath a fall of rocks. Dengar scrabbled aboard the curved metal, nearly a meter in width, and climbed the rest of the way up to where the barge's bow had been, and now only the exposed beam was left, tilted into the cloudless sky. He wrapped one arm around the end, then, with his other hand unslung, the electro binoculars from his belt and brought them up to his eyes. The rangefinder numbers skittered at the bottom of his field of vision as he scanned across the horizon. This was a pointless trip, Dengar thought disgustedly. He leaned out farther from the keel beam, still examining the wasteland through the binox. His bounty hunting career had never been such a raging success that he'd been able to refrain from any other kind of scrabbling hustle that chanced to come his way. It was a hard trade for a human to get ahead in, considering the number of other species in the galaxy that worked in it, all of them uglier and tougher. Droids, too. 
so a little bit of scavenger work was nothing he was unused to. The best would have been if he'd found any survivors out here that could either pay him for their rescue, or that he could ransom off to whatever connections they might have. The late Jabber's court had been opulent and lucrative, enough to attract more than the usual lowlifes that one encountered on Tatooine. But the bunch of rubble Dengar had found out here, the few scattered and poured over bits of the sail barge and the smaller skiffs that hovered alongside as outriders, the dead bodyguards and warriors, wasn't worth two lead ingots to him. Anything of value was already trundling away in the Jawas' slow, tank-treaded sand crawlers, leaving nothing but bones and worthless scrap behind. Might as well just stay here, he thought and wait. He'd sent his bride-to-be, Manaru, aloft in his ship, the punishing one, to do a high-altitude reconnaissance of the area. Soon enough she'd be finished with the task and would come back to fetch him. The knot of frustration in Dengar's gut was instantly replaced with surprise as the keel beam suddenly tilted almost vertical. The strap of the electro-binoculars cut across his throat as they flew away from his eyes. He held on with both hands as the beam pitched skyward, as though it were on a storm-tossed ocean of water rather than sand. Charred metal scraped tight against the ammo pouches on his chest as the keel beam rotated. As the beam twisted about, Dengar could see the surrounding dunes, heaving in a slow, seismic counterpoint to the wrecked barge's motion, cliff faces of rock and sand shearing away and tumbling downward, slower clouds of dust stacking across the sun's smoldering faces. At the center of the dunes, the slope grew deeper, like a funnel with a black hole at its center. Another shudder ran beneath the planet's surface and the keel beam rolled almost sideways, nearly dislodging Dengar from his grasp upon it. His feet swung out from beneath him. Dengar looked down, past his own boots, and saw that the whole of the bottom of the sand funnel was lined with teeth. Jaws clenched, Dengar muttered an obscenity from his own world. You knurling idiot! He cursed his own stupidity, getting himself stuck here in the middle of the air with no escape route. He hadn't considered what his presence might awaken and how hungry it might be. The great pit of Carcoon gaped wider, sand and rubble swirling around the blind, all-devouring Sarlacc creature at the center of the vortex. A sour stench hit Dengar like a wind hotter than any that had crossed the desert's reaches. A glance around him revealed to Dengar that the keel beam had slid partway down the funnel then snagged on a solid rock outcropping. He turned his face against his shoulder as the sail's barge's scattered debris rained past him. The larger pieces hitting the pit's sloping sides and pitching end over end into the Sarlacc's gaping maw. The keel beam gave a sudden lurch in Dengard's sweating grasp as the end below him shattered part of the outcropping. Suddenly, the beam swayed backward, leaving him dangling precariously, only a couple of meters from the Sarlacc's throat. A pumping kick enabled him to get first one, then the other of his boot soles up onto the beam. He squatted into a deep knee bend on the narrow metal surface, then jumped, fingertips clawing for the funnel's edge above him. His belly hit the slope. Sand slid maddeningly under his hands as he thrashed and kicked, struggling toward the bright and empty sky. With a gasp of effort, Dengar managed to get his chest across the shifting edge of the funnel, then scrabbled the rest of his body over and tumbled down the other side. Too bad for the jar was. That was all that Dengar could think of as he wrapped his arms around himself and waited for the animate disturbance in Tatooine's crust to subside. There might have been something of worth brought to the surface, but unless the little scroungers wanted to dive down to Sarlacc's throat to get it, that load of valuable salvage was lost to them now. The dune sea grew silent again. Dengar let a minute pass, 
measured by his heartbeat gradually slowing to normal, then scrambled to his feet. The Sarlacc had most likely pulled its head back underground and was busy digesting the bits of wreckage it had just been fed, or trying to. He figured that would give him time enough to get a safe distance away, if he hurried. Brushing sand from his gear, Dengar started trudging up the slope of the nearest dune. Three dunes later, he stopped to catch his breath. To his amazement, he saw that the scraps of debris, the barely distinguishable pieces of Jabba the Hutt's sail barge, still filled the center of the pit. The truth dawned on him. It's dead, thought Dengar. Something, or someone, had managed to kill the Sarlacc. The rotting stench had been from the creature's own torn apart flesh, visible beneath the wreckage. Now, the sense of life, however malignant, beneath the desert's surface was extinguished. Only bits of wreckage, no longer recognizable as to form and function, and a few face-down bodies lay scattered around the empty zone. The stink from the slope-sided hole motivated Dengar in the opposite direction, toward Jabba's palace. This was as good a time as any for him to verify the rumors about what the palace had become since the death of the hut. The orgiastic celebration of Jabba's liberated underlings had been just beginning. The last time Dengar had been inside the forbidding windowless pile. If the palace was empty now, reports differed on that score, then the thick walls of interior chambers would give him a safe place to hang out while night and its attendant hazards took possession of the dune sea and he waited for Manaru's return. His own private hideout, which he previously carved into a desert ridge of stone and stocked with supplies, would have done the same. But at the palace, there might be some remnants of Jabba's court, like the huts Manjor Domo, Bib Fortuna, and others who would be looking for ways to profit by the employer's death. Great minds think alike, Dengar noted wryly. Or at least, the greedy ones do. He gave the area one more scan, sweeping the horizon with the electro binoculars. One of the suns had already begun to set, pushing his own shadow ahead across the wasteland. He had just about to power off the binox, when he spotted something nearly 50 meters away. That one looks like he took the worst of it. Another corpse lay on a stretch of rough gravel. Face up, Dengar could make out from the front of the narrow aperture helmet. That was about all of the corpse's gear that was intact. The rest of the dead man's gear looked as if it hadn't been burned away so much as dissolved, with some kind of acid bath reducing uniform and armaments to rags and corroded, pitted shapes of useless metal and plastoid. Dengar tumble-wheeled the binops into closer focus, trying to figure out what could have happened to a creature with that kind of lethal effect. Wait a minute. The sprawled form filled the electrobinox's lenses. Maybe not exactly lethal, Dengar corrected himself. He could see the figure's chest moving. A slight rise and fall, right on the edge of survival. The half-naked combatant, whoever it might be, was still alive, or at least for the time being. Now that was worth checking out. Dengar slung the Binox back onto his equipment belt. If only to satisfy his own curiosity, the distant figure looked as if he discovered a whole new way of getting killed. As a bounty hunter and general purveyor of violence, Dengar felt a professional interest in the matter. He glanced over his shoulder and saw his own ship, the Punishing One, descending a few kilometers away, its landing gear extended. His bride-to-be, Manaru, was at the ship's controls. Good, thought Dengar. He'd be able to use her help now that he had determined that there would be no immediate danger to her. He didn't mind risking his own life, but hers was another matter. Balancing himself with one hand held back against the slope of the dune, Dengar worked his way toward the humanoid shape mystery he'd spotted. He hoped the other man would still be alive by the time he got there. 
but this way of dying's not so bad. Somewhere, past a jumble of disjointed thoughts and images, the oleandrous voice of Jabba the Hutt could be heard in memory, promising a new definition of pain, one that would last a thousand years, excruciating and never-ending. The fat slug had been correct about that, to a degree. The dying man had to admit, or was he already dead? He couldn't tell. This fate, the infinitely slow etching away molecule by molecule of epidermis and nerve endings, had been intended for someone else. It struck the dying man as no more unjust than all the rest of the universe's workings that he should suffer it instead. Or have suffered it because the hut seemed to have been misinformed about how long the dissolution and torment would last. A few seconds had been more than adequate for pain's new meaning to have become clear, as the enfolding darkness's acids had seeped through uniform and armament, touching skin like the fire of a thousand coming-led suns. And those few seconds, and the minutes, and hours, days, years, that followed, had indeed seemed to stretch out to eternity. But they had ended. That pain beyond anything he had ever endured or inflicted had come to a stop, replaced by the simpler and duller ebbing away of life force. By comparison, that was a comfort like drifting asleep on pillows of satin filled with downy feathers. Even the blindness, the perfect acidic night, had been broken by a muted dawn. The dying man could still not see, but he could sense through the T-shaped visor of his helmet and the wet rag swaddling him, the unmistakable photonic warmth of sun against his face and the eroded skin of his chest. Perhaps, the dying man thought, it reached up into the sky and swallowed them up too. The giant mouth, when he'd fallen down its ranks of razor teeth, had seemed that big. But now, he felt gravel and sand beneath his spine, and his own blood miring him to the ground. That had to be some kind of tactile hallucination. He had no gods to thank, but was grateful anyway for the blessings of madness. The light on his face dimmed. The differential in temperature was enough that he could just make out the blurred edges of a shadow falling onto him. He wondered what new vision his agony, fractured brain was about to conjure up. There were others he knew here in the belly of the beast. He had seen them fall and be swallowed up. A little company, the dying man decided. He might as well hallucinate voices from those about to be digested. It would help pass the long, endless hours before his own body's atoms floated free from one another. One of the voices he heard was his own. Help. What happened? He could almost have laughed if any twitch of his raw muscles hadn't hurt so much, pushing him towards unconsciousness, oblivion. Shouldn't hallucinations know these things? Salak swallowed me. The words seemed to come of their own volition. I killed it. Blew it up. He heard another voice. A female's. He's dying. The man's voice spoke again in hushed tones. Meru, do you know who this is? I don't care. Help me get him inside. The female's shadow fell across him. Suddenly, he felt himself rising. Dirt and grit falling from his mangled form. The next sensation was that of being thrown across someone's broad shoulder, an arm encircling his waist to steady him. A sense of shame filled the dying man. There had been so many times when he had faced his own extinction, painful or otherwise. The contemplation of his death and the dismissal of it as being of no concern had given him strength. And now, some weak part of him had summoned up this pitiful fantasy of rescue. Better to die, he thought, than to fear dying. Hang on, came the hallucinated voice. I'll get you someplace safe. 
The man called Boba Fett felt the jostle of the other's footsteps, the motion of being carried across the stony ground. For a moment, his vision cleared, the blindness dissipating enough that he could see his own hand flopping, limp and disjointed, leaving a trail of spattered blood on the sand. That was when he knew that what he saw and felt was real, and that he was still alive. Okay, and that is something for chapter one. So, now, um, obviously, if you come and hang out with us on Sunday here in the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel, you will see myself, Gilbert, and a special guest discussing the first episode of The Book of Boba. So we can think a little bit about how this is going to compare to the TV show. One of the things that Gilbert wanted to know in the episode is how did he get out of that Sarlacc pit? We want Boba to talk more on it. Now, Gilbs, if you're listening out there, let us know below. Join in. Is this what you thought? Because it seems like Boba doesn't even know how he got out of the Sarlacc pit. Now, does that suggest that someone else killed the Sarlacc and got him out? Or is it that Boba's just natural instincts for survival meant that he fought his way out and didn't even remember? An interesting thought. It'd be interesting to see what the real truth is, at least within this book. Obviously, this book is only one story of Boba, only one accounting of his great survival of the Sarlacc pit, and not necessarily canon anymore. In fact, a little bit unlikely to be canon, given how old this book is. So, that's interesting. Dengar. Um, is Dengar a character that we already know? If so, let me know in the comments. I am often not up to date with all of um, Star Wars side characters, so I can get things wrong. But, whilst you're in the comments correcting me and letting me know what a Star Wars noob I am, we will carry on to chapter 2. A small object, moving by its own power through the cold expanses between the stars, had finally breached the planet's sensory perimeter. Kuat of Kuat had held the hyperspace messenger pod's approach even before his own corporate security chief came to tell him that it had been intercepted. He had a fine-tuned awareness of machines, from the smallest nanosporoids to the constructions capable of annihilating worlds. It was a family trait, something encoded deep within the Kuat blood for generations. Excuse me, technician. An obsequious voice came from behind him. But you asked to be notified as the outer calm units picked up any traces of your... package. Kuat of Kuat turned away from the great domed viewport and its vistas of emptiness studded with light. Far beyond the expanded orbit of the planet that bore the name identical to his, the hazy arm of one of the galaxy's more aesthetically pleasing spiral nebulae was about to rise into sight. He tried not to miss things like that. They served to remind him that the universe and all its interconnected workings was, in its essence, a machine like other machines. Even its constituent atoms, beyond the confusion of uncertainty principles and observer effects, ticked like ancient, primitive chrono-gears. And finer things than that, Kuat of Kuat told himself, not for the first time. Such as men's spirits. Those were machines as well. However, ineffable their substance. Very well, he stroked the silky fur of the felinx cradled in his arms. The animal made a deep, barely audible sound of contentment as his long, precise fingers found a specific zone between the triangular ears. That's just what I've been expecting. Machines, even the ones built in the Kuat drive yards, did not always function as intended. There were random variables that sometimes deposited metaphorical sand in the gears. It was a pleasure frequent, but still undiminished, when things did work according to plan. Has there been any readouts of the contents? Not yet. Fernald, the security chief, was dressed in standard Kuat Drive Yard's work suit, devoid of any emblem of rank except a variable dispersion blaster slung conspicuously at his hip. There is a full crew working on it, but... 
A wry smile lifted the corner of his mouth. The encryption codes are rather tight. They're meant to be. Kuat of Kuat would not be disappointed if the KDY employees weren't able to crack them. He had designed them himself. Setting security's info analysis division to work on them was a mere test to see how well he'd done. I don't care for anyone else reading my mail. Of course not. A slight nod in acknowledgement. Despite the importance of Kuat Drive Yards as the elite and most powerful contractor of engineering and construction services to the Empire, the formalities of KDY headquarters were minimal and had been for generations. Pomp and show and courtly flourishes were for those who didn't understand where true power came from. Fenald gestured toward the viewport, its hexagonal strutwork curving three times higher than his boss's imposing two-meter height. I doubt if anyone has. The feelings purred louder in Kuat of Kuat's arms. He'd found the exact spot wired into its pleasure centers. Born that way, a good amount of the minimal brain mass of the animal's excessively narrow skull, a trait of its inbred species, he'd had to replace with biosimulation circuits to keep it from bumping into walls and gnawing the raw flesh between its fur. His fingertips felt the edge of the cut into the animal's skull as he stroked it. Transmuted even this far into a true machine, the animal was much more satisfactory. And, in ways Kuat of Kuat appreciated, even more beautiful. A single bell note sounded in the spacious office suite of the KDY's hereditary CEO. Kuat of Kuat turned back to gaze at the viewport's limitless vista as his security chief leaned the side of his head against the small transponder embedded in his palm. The feelings had closed its eyes in ecstasy. It didn't see the rising edge of the far distant nebula, like luminous smoke against black. They're bringing it in now, said Fenald. Excellent. Outside, in vacuum, an ion engine streaked fiery red, moving past the seemingly chaotic maze of construction platforms and grav dock bays at a navigable sublight speed. The small utility shuttle, with its precious cargo aboard, was headed for the core of KDY's industrial complex. Perhaps a quarter of a standard time part before the shuttle arrived, Kuat of Kuat glanced over his shoulder at the other man. You don't need to wait, he smiled. I'll take care of it myself. Security chiefs were paid to be curious about everything that happened within their sphere of operations. As you please, technician. The words were spoken with a stiffened spine and a nod just bordering on curtness. He was also paid to obey orders. Let me know if there is anything else you require in regard to this matter. The feelings protested as Kuat of Kuat bent down, depositing it on the intricately tessellated floor. Tail demandingly erect, the creature rubbed itself against the trouser leg cut to the same utilitarian dark green as all the other work uniforms worn by KDY employees. The concerns of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, perhaps the most powerful beyond Emperor Palpatine's inner circle, didn't matter to the animal. A heat source and continued stroking were the limits of its desires. As Kuat of Kuat straightened back up, the office suite's doors slid shut behind the departing chief of security. The Felix bumped its head more intensely against his shin. Not now, Kuat told it. I've got work to do. Persistence was a trait he admired. He couldn't be angry at the animal when it jumped up on his workbench. He let it march back and forth, level with his chest, as he assembled the necessary tools. Only when the pilot of the shuttle team, whose flight he had spotted from the viewport, entered and placed an elongated silver ovoid on the bench, then withdrew from his presence, did Kuat of Kuat shoo the animal away. A pair of hovering work lights drew closer, 
erasing all shadow, as he leaned over the mirror-finished torpedo. This message pod was not just wired with, but actually built of self-destruct modules to prevent unauthorized access or access by anyone except Kuat of Kuat himself. And even that was intended to be difficult. If he erred now, KDY would have a new hereditary owner and chief designer. Held between thumb and forefinger, an identity probe bit almost painlessly into his flesh, drawing samples of fluid and tissue. The microcircuitry inside the slender needle-like device ran through its programming, matching both genetic information and the auto-mutating radioactive traces that had been injected into his bloodstream. The probe gave no sign, audible or visible, whether everything checked out. The only indication would be when he held the inoxide tip to the messenger pod. If his charred remains weren't embedded in the wall behind him, then all was as it should be. The probe tip clicked against the curved, reflective surface. No explosion resulted, except for the slight one of his held breath being released. A hairline fissure opened along the side of the pod. The work went faster now, as Kuat of Kuat pried open the silvery ovoid, dismantling the pieces of its shell in a precise order. A misstep, a segment taken out of turn, would also result in a fatal explosion. But he wasn't concerned about that happening. The only place where the proper sequence had been put down was in his memory, but no more accurate record could be imagined. When he admired machines, he admired himself. The one on the workbench functioned just as perfectly. The last of the encasing shell separated into its component parts and fell away from the core. You've come a long way, little one. He laid a tender, possessive hand on the hollow projector unit that had been revealed. Just what do you have to tell me? A fading heat radiated into Kuat of Kuat's palm. The messenger pod's energy cell was an accelerated decay module, producing enough power for a one-time jump in and out of hyperspace. The navigational coordinates were hardwired. A matter of a few days ago, it had left the distant world of Tatooine. It would have reached the Kuat Drive Yard's headquarters even sooner if a randomizing sublet process hadn't been programmed to evade detection. Kuat of Kuat's own security men weren't the only ones watching the perimeter. A matter of business. Paranoia was one of the operating costs that came with being of service to the Emperor. Hands sheathed in insulating gloves, Kuat of Kuat lifted out the hollow projector. A standard playback unit, similar to ones found throughout the galaxy, but with tweaks and modifications far beyond the ordinary. Palpatine himself couldn't get this kind of detail in his communications with his various underlings. But then, he doesn't need it, Kuat of Kuat reminded himself. Not the way I do. The Emperor could always get what he wanted through fear and death. In the engineering business, one had to be a little more careful not to eliminate one's market. Go away, he said to the feelings winding between his ankles. You won't like this. The Felix didn't heed the warning. When Kuat of Kuat used the rest of his precise tools to complete the circuits inside the hollow projector, the images and sounds of another great room were laid over the office suite. The oppressive darkness generated by the recording and its chaos of noises, from the rattling of subsurface chains to cruel, cross-species laughter, brought the silken fur straight up along the animal's spine. It hissed at what it saw, particularly the hologram form of a grossly elephantine individual with tiny hands and immense, greedy eyes. When that image's lipless mouth opened to emit wetly glottal laughter, the feelings scrambled to safety beneath the farthest corner of the workbench. Kuat of Kuat used the magnetically fastened tip of the probe to freeze the playback. The cacophony was replaced by silence as he glanced over his shoulder, 
and saw the court of Jabba the Hutt rendered motionless. He turned away from the bench and walked into the centre of the hologram. The forms were insubstantial as ghosts. He could have passed his hand through any one of the sycophants and hangers-on surrounding the hut's throne-like hover platform. But, detailed in such perfection that he could almost smell the sweat and rank odours of decay rising from the grates in the synthesised floors. You're dead, aren't you? With a thin smile, he brought his face close to the still image of Jabba the Hutt. That's such a shame. I hate to lose a good customer. Over the years, Jabba had commissioned several large orders. Lethal equipment for his thugs and hirelings from KDY's personal armaments division. Plus elaborate palace furnishings and a superbly appointed sail barge with military retrofits from one of the Kuat subsidiaries devoted to luxury vessels. There had been extras thrown in that Jabba had known nothing about, hidden recording devices that had captured nearly everything that took place in the palace on Tatooine and aboard the floating barge. A good contractor, thought Kuat of Kuat, known his accounts better than they even know themselves. <laughs> Word of the hut's death had already seeped through the galaxy, gladdening many setting off an acquisitive scramble amongst others. Of all of his species, Jabba had been the most active. If that word could be applied to something so obese and slow, and with the farthest reach in his shady enterprises, they're already at each other's throats. The late Hutt's associates, including Jabba's own supposedly grieving relations, struggling for control of his intricate and criminal legacy. That would be good for business. Kuat of Kuat already had appointments scheduled with some of the worst and most ambitious of the lot. New plans always called for new weapons. The notion of throats mordantly amused him. What he'd already heard about Jabba the Hutt's death was confirmed by the holographic image. One of Jabba's ineffectual little hands held a length of chain, its other end fastened to a collar around the neck of a human form, standing at the edge of the recreated platform. Kuat of Kuat appraised with a connoisseur's eye the revealed attractiveness of Princess Leia Organa. His own wealth and power had brought many varieties of feminine beauty through his private quarters, even from the highest ranks of the nobility. The princess, however. He made a mental note to seek this woman's acquaintance, if he ever had the opportunity. If it happened, he wouldn't be such an idiot as to leave something as simple and deadly as an iron chain lying around. Never hand your enemy. Kuat of Kuat spoke aloud to the dead hut's image. The means by which she can kill you. Jabba's death was a minor concern at the moment, though even the presence of Leia Organa at the late hut's court was at this moment of no great significance to Kuat. There were others that he sought, faces to be found in the past. He returned to his workbench and, with a few delicate adjustments to the playback unit, ran the recording back toward the beginning, before Leia Organa had ever entered Jabba's palace, disguised as a ubis bounty hunter with captured Wookiee in tow. That should do it, thought Kuat as he glanced over his shoulder. He lifted the probe's tip from the device, freezing the image once again. Stepping past Jabba's throne-like platform, Kuat of Kuat looked around the hologram of the hut's court. The assembled faces were a rogue's gallery of interstellar villainy, ranging from petty theft to murder and beyond. Huts tended to attract these types, the way small fur-bearing animals attract fleas. Though in a certain sense, it was a symbiotic rather than parasitic relationship. At home, in his palace, Jabba had been able to look around himself and at least see sentient creatures whose morals were on par or even below his own. Kuat of Kuat walked slowly through the recreated court. 
looking for one face in particular. Not even a face, but a mask. He paused before the frozen image of Jabba's Majordomo, a glittering-eyed, evilly smiling Twi'lek named Bib Fortuna. The males of the planet Ryloth, even with all the extra cognitive abilities packed into the heavy, tapering appendages hanging from their bare skulls onto their shoulders, had no capacity for generating wealth and no courage to steal it, even though they were nearly as avaricious as huts. This particular one had tried to worm his way into the Kuat Driveyard's corporate bureaucracy before a noteworthy display of untrustworthiness had gotten him booted from the headquarters on the planet Kuat. Huts, however, had more of a taste for flattery and tail-kissing. Kuat of Kuat wasn't surprised that Fortuna had wound up in Jabba's palace. He didn't spot what he was looking for, until he raised his eyes toward the holographic court's encircling gallery. There he is, thought Kuat of Kuat, the distinctive helmeted visage of Boba Fett. The galaxy's most feared bounty hunter gazed down at the mingled courtiers below like a totem of some planet's primordial deity, contemplating a justice colder than the spaces between the stars. Arrayed along Fett's arms and slung at his back were his working tools, the wrist lasers, a miniaturized flamethrower, and all the other weapons that were as precise in his hands as the tiny probes were in Kuat of Kuat's. The helmet, with its dark, T-shaped visor, hid the bounty hunter's eyes and the measured calculations going on behind them. Satisfied for the moment, Kuat of Kuat walked back to the edge of the hologram, even being in a three-dimensional simulation of Jabba's court, with its miasma of avarice and bad hygiene, brought a twinge of nausea to his gut. Better to watch from the outside of the hologram, from the pristine and mathematic angles of his own office. At the workbench, he adjusted the probe's angle in the projector's circuits. Without even glancing over his shoulder, he could sense Jabba's image and the others in the hut's dimly lit court restored to motion acting out their parts in this little segment of the past. Another adjustment muted the audio portion of the playback. Kuat of Kuat didn't need to hear the Jabba's slobbering voice and cruel laughter of his sycophants to discern what was happening. Another Twi'lek, a female. On Ryloth, the females were nowhere as repulsive as their male counterparts, had become the source for Jabba's amusement. A pretty slave... A pantaloon dancing girl with her distinctive twilight head appendages decorated to resemble an ancient court jester's cap of bells. But her childlike appeal and grace wasn't enough to satisfy her master's appetites. A look of apprehension, close to panic, had moved across her face as she had sat decorously at one side of the court, as though she'd had a prescient glimpse of her fate which was being played out again as the image of Jabba the Hutt, wattled bulk jiggling and eyes widening with delight, reeled in the chain fastened to the Twi'lek dancing girl's iron collar, dragging her toward the throne-like platform. The poor girl must have seen the same thing happen to others before her. Beautiful creatures had been a disposable commodity for Jabba. Just as Kuat of Kuat expected, the next few moments of the playback showed the trap door sliding open in front of Jabba's platform. The dancing girl's fall snapped the links of the chain. The court's motley denizens clustered around the grates, straining to watch her death at the claws and teeth of the rancor, Jabba's favourite pet in the darkness below. The nausea returned to Kuat of Kuat's stomach, sharpened to disgust. A waste! he thought. The dancing girl had been beautiful enough to be useful to someone. The destruction of such a pretty device angered him more than anything else. He'd seen enough, at least this level of detail. If the fat slug was as dead as has been reported, he now didn't regret the loss of trade. There'd be others moving up the ranks of the Huttese species, galaxy-wide hierarchy, Kuat of Kuat reached over and froze the playback. 
the better to scan the images for the one in whom he had the most interest, and who was no longer there in the hologram. The helmeted visage of the bounty hunter was missing where Kuat of Kuat had spotted it before, up on the gallery overlooking the central area of Drabba's court. Kuat of Kuat stepped away from the workbench and across the nearest edge of the hologram, looking up toward the simulation of the rough domed ceiling, then around to the openings of low, tunnel-like passages branching off to other parts of the palace. The image of Boba Fett was nowhere to be seen. Kuat of Kuat ran the recording unit back to the point where the bounty hunter, face hidden behind the visored mask of his uniform, could be seen watching the court below him. This time, he didn't let himself be distracted by the fate of the Twi'lek dancing girl starting up the playback again. He saw where Boba Fett had slipped unannounced from the gallery and out of the court, even before Jabba had started pulling on the chain and dragging the girl over the trap door. Interesting. Kuat of Kuat let the holographic recording play on. Our friend, he thought, had another agenda. Not surprising. Boba Fett had not reached the top of the bounty hunter trade without building up a network of business interests and contacts, some of them, if not most, completely unaware of each other. Jabba the Hutt might not have been stupid enough to believe that paying Fett a generous retainer, he had thereby secured the bounty hunter's exclusive services. If so, that indicated how much Jabba had been slipping making the kind of mistakes that had led to his death. Always a mistake to completely trust a bounty hunter. Kuat of Kuat didn't commit mistakes like that. Kuat ran the hologram playback forward. There was no sign of Boba Fett until much farther on in the recording. He spotted the bounty hunter's image, then, snapping a blaster rifle up into firing position as the disguised Leia Organa held up an activated thermal detonator and demanded payment for the captive Wookiee she'd brought. That potentially lethal confrontation had ended with the hut's guttural laughter and admiration for his resourceful opponent. The bounty for Chewbacca had been paid, and Boba Fett had lowered his weapon. So he did return there, mused Kuat as he watched the hologram. Whatever mysterious appointments Boba Fett might have kept in Jabba's palace, they hadn't prevented him from attending to his duties as the hut's freelance bodyguard. It was a safe assumption that the reports gathered by Kuat's corporate intelligence division were accurate. They had described Jabba's death out on his sail barge, hovering at the edge of the great pit of Carcoon in Tatooine's Dune Sea, and had mentioned Boba Fett being there at the struggle. More than that, the reports had also described Boba Fett's death. What Kuat of Kuat wanted proof of was that. Operating without that proof was like building a machine with a critical component left untested. A machine, he thought, that could kill its master if it broke down. Someone like Boba Fett had a disquieting habit of survival. Kuat of Kuat would have to see that the bounty hunter's death before he would believe it. He looked at the pieces of the messenger pod and its curved, reflective casing scattered on the workbench. The next pod to drop out of hyperspace and penetrate the planet Kuat's atmosphere would very likely carry the necessary information inside it. All the units had been designed to carry only partial segments of what had been recorded at Jabba's palace and aboard the hut's sail barge. There was a less likelihood that way of any KDY's powerful enemies intercepting the units and, if they managed to get past the security procedures, figuring out Kuat of Kuat's own concerns. One last thing to do with this message. He reached into the device and extracted the microprobe. The breaking of the circuit initiated the self-destruct program. The metal grew white hot, twisting in upon itself as it was consumed. From underneath the bench, the feelings fled in terror, streaking toward the office suite's farthest recesses. A few more seconds passed. Then, the hollow projector and its contents had been reduced to blackened slag on the workbench's surface, cooling into a single, indecipherable hieroglyph. 
the contents of the message that had come so far to reach him was safely locked away in Kuat of Kuat's memory. When proof of Boba Fett's death came, he might allow himself to forget the smallest particle of information. When it's safe, Kuat of Kuat had already decided. Not until then. And if that proof didn't come, he would have to make other plans. Plans that would include more than one death as part of their internal workings. Meshing gears often had cruelly sharp teeth. He turned away from the workbench and walked slowly through the empty spaces of the office suite, looking for the Felix, so that he could pick it up and cradle it in his arms and soothe it of the fright it had received. And that is the end of chapter two. Not really revealing anything that much more about Boba. All we're seeing are things largely that we know, things from uh, the original movies. But this new character, Kuat of Kuat, completely new to me. Does anyone else in the comments, do you guys know this dude? Is he someone who already exists? I'm also not sure what Kuat people are like. I don't quite understand if this character is supposed to be human or something different. Seems like something different since how tall he is, but hey, we've seen some tall people, so maybe not that bad. I'm interested in the feelings, that was kind of cute. I like the fact that it's as lazy a sci-fi thing as that. It's like, it's a space cat, it's called a feelings. Is that kind of a, a cop-out? Is that a bit too easy? What do you think? And interesting to see that we're already kind of kicking off with the intrigue here so this kuat guy it's cool to see that we're learning a bit about the people who supply things to the empire um how they're involved how they're all tied up into it so i'd like to see where he's going with this but right now couldn't tell you couldn't tell you why he needs to see who boba fett is especially why boba is more important than the death of jabba you'd think that'd be the big deal now, I'd be interested to know if Boba has a bounty out, maybe, on Kuat. Do you think perhaps that's it, that he already was supposed to be killing him and Kuat can only feel safe once he you knows Boba is dead? Perhaps. But whilst we're mulling on that and you're in the comments letting me know your theories or letting me know the truth if you've read the book already, although, hey, we'll try and uh, spare spoilers for the rest of our listeners, we'll move on to Chapter 3 and see how this progresses. Chapter 3 it took some doing, but she found him, for the second time. The girl crouched behind one of the June Sea's rocky outcroppings as she watched the barely noticeable hole dug into the barren ground below. The twin suns bled into the horizon, the chill Tatooine night already unfolding across the sands. Around her bare shoulders, she pulled a tighter, a salvaged scrap of sail-barged canopy blackened by fire and explosion along one ragged edge, stiff with dried blood along another. The delicate fabrics with which her body had been adorned in Jabba's palace were little protection against the cold. A shiver touched her flesh as she continued to watch and wait. She'd known that the bounty hunter, the one called Dengar, would have some hiding place away from Jabba the Hutt's palace. What used to be his palace? she corrected herself. The monstrous slug was dead now. That had held the other end of her chain and the chains of other dancers. But when Jabba had been alive, most of the thugs and bodyguards in his employ had had little warrens out in the rocky wastes, where they could steal themselves in for a few hours' sleep, safe from being murdered by each other or by their boss. Jabba's court hadn't been an easy place to survive in, she knew that better than anyone. But it's not me who died, she thought with a bitter satisfaction. Jabba got what he deserved. In the dimming light, she put away her brooding, the little vengeful spark that kept her warm inside. She'd spotted, down below, the approaching figures for which she'd been waiting. Two medic droids trundled across the sand, their parallel tracks headed toward the warren hole in the rocky wasteland. They were probably refugees from Jabba's palace, just as she was. All of the medic droids there had been modified with wheels in place of the original stumpy legs, so they could get around in the desert terrain. Neela watched them for a few seconds more, then eased out of her hiding place and carefully worked her way down the farther side of the dune, 
where the droids wouldn't be able to see her. Hold it right there! She caught the droids just as they were transmitting the security code that would unseal the subsurface warren. A row of numbers, softly glowing red, showed on the panel embedded in the magnetically reinforced Jura steel. Don't move. I promise I won't hurt you, but don't move. Are you frightened? The taller of the two medical droids, a basic MD-5 general practitioner model, scanned her against the hull's rough circle of the evening sky. Your pulse is quite elevated for a standard humanoid form. A uh, plus, a tiny grid iris opened on the droid's dark enameled head, drawing in an air sample. Your perspiration contains significant levels of hormones indicating an emotionally agitated state. Shut up! I also want you to do that. Rocks slid loose beneath her as she scrambled down towards the droids. Just shut up. Did you hear that? The taller droid swiveled its multi-lensed gaze towards its companion, a white-banded MD3 pharmaceutical model. She's telling us to be quiet. Rudeness. Dust sifted from the shorter one as it tucked its syringes and dispensed appendages closer to itself. Foresight of difficulties? Great! Anger spurred her heart even faster. Then you can't say you didn't know this was coming. She grabbed a vital signs monitor sticking out, antenna-like from the taller one's head, and slammed the droid against the dirt wall of the Warren entrance, hard enough to send the lights dancing across the front display panel. Another pull in the opposite direction sent it crashing into the other droid. That one squealed as it toppled over, exposing the wheeled traction devices below the lower rim of its cylindrical body. Now how about shutting up? It seems like a very good idea. The taller droid retreated, flattening itself against the unopened security hatch. She gulped down a deep breath, trying through sheer willpower to slow down her heartbeat and still the trembling in her hands. Few violent acts had been required of her in life. As far as she knew, she had no memories of any life before finding herself at Jabba's palace, and, even as something as minor as banging a little sense into the mechanical droids' heads was enough to dizzy her. Get used to it, she sternly told herself. The realization had already come to her that a lot more scary things were going to happen. That was all right. At least she was alive. Others in her position hadn't been so fortunate. The memory was still vivid inside her, of seeing the other dancing girl falling into the pit beneath Jabba's palace. That memory ended with screams, and the slavering growls of Jabba's pet rancor. Excuse me, your ladyship. That puzzled her. Neither Jabba the Hutt nor any of his others at his court had ever called her anything like that. Uh, but you require medical attention. The taller droid kept its speech mechanism at a minimal volume. A hand-like examination module, with a fiber-optic light source mounted at the wrist, reached tentatively toward her face. That's a very bad wound. She slapped away the droid's hand before it could touch the edges of the jagged line running down one side of her face. It'll heal. With a scar. The taller droid shone the beam of its hand light lower down to where the wound, the physical memory of a Gamorian pike staff, ended below her throat. We could do something about that to make it better. Why bother? Other memories, nearly as unpleasant as those from the pit, flooded her thoughts. Whatever her life may have been before, the time in Java's palace had been enough to convince her that beauty was a dangerous thing to possess. It had been just enough to entice Jabba's sticky hands, and the hands of those underlings who'd been his current favorites, but not enough to protect her when the hut grew bored with her charms. I could do without it, she said bitterly. Anger, noted the other medical droid. Needlessly, the scent of negative emotion was almost palpable in the Warren's Hall's entrance. Treatment inadvisability. I remember seeing you, the taller droid's low, soothing voice continued, at Jabba's palace. The hand light beam moved across her face. You were part of the entertainment. I was. 
She glanced over her shoulder toward the Warren's darkening entrance to make sure no one was approaching, then turned back toward the droids. But not now. Oh! An inquiring gaze seemed to move behind the droid's optic receptors. Then what are you? I... I don't know. Name, spoke the shorter of the two droids. Designation. They called me... Jabba called me Neela. She frowned. Something, the absence of memory, rather than anything she could actually recall, told her that wasn't right. That name's a lie, she thought. But that's what they called me. There's worse names. Voice brightening, the taller droid tried to comfort her. Considering my own sub-identity coding, its complicated hand pointing to the data readout on the front of its dark metallic body. SH Epsilon 1B. Most sentient creatures can't even pronounce it. This one's luckier. 1-E-X-E, the short droid extruded a pill-dispensing module and gently tapped the back of her hand with it. Acquaintance. Pleasure. They're working on me, thought Neela. She knew enough about mechanical droids, but from where? To be aware of the soothing effects they were designed to provoke in their patients. Anesthetic radiation. She could feel a low-level electromagnetic field locking into sync with the neurons inside her head, drawing out the lulling endorphins. Knock it off! She growled. She shook her head, snapping herself free of the droid's influence. I don't need that either. Not now. Neela drew one hand back in a small but effective fist. If I have to whack you again, I will. Like extinguishing a torch, the field abruptly cut out. As you wish, said SH Epsilon 1B. We're only trying to help. By the way, a quick interlude. I think I'm going to call that character Shelby. We all good with that? Shelby? Loving it. You can do that by telling me where he is. The wound across her face stung once more, but she ignored it. Who? She nodded toward the security hatch. The bounty hunter. The one whose hiding place this is. Dengar? One of Shelby's metallic hands pointed toward the warren opening behind her. He's back at Jabba's place. Supplies. Noted. Okay, and for this guy, 1-E-X-E, we've got to call him Lexi. Supplies, noted Lexi. Various. That's right. Shelby opened a small cargo pod bolted to the side of its body. He sent us back here with what we acquired, as you see. Antibiotics, metabolic accelerators, sterile gel dressings. Fine. Neela interrupted the droid's inventory of its contents. But Dengar, he's still back at the palace? Shelby's head unit gave a nod. He said he wanted to find one of Jabba's caches of off-planet edibles. That might take some time, though. The palace has been very badly looted by the hut's former employees. Mess. Lexi rotated the top dome of its cylinder back and forth. Disgust. There wasn't time to consider her decision. Open the hatch, said Neela, pointing to the magnetically sealed disk the coded digits still blinking in its readout panel. I want to go inside. Dengar told us not to let... The taller of the two droids caught the look in Neela's eyes. All right, all right, I'm opening it. The tunnel on the other side of the hatch descended at close to a 45-degree angle. Heading down it with the droids clunking behind her, Neela felt a claustrophobic panic crawling across her spine. The darkness and the close, scarcely ventilated air felt like the tunnel through which she'd crawled to escape from Jabba's palace. After what had happened to her poor friend Ula, any risk had seemed preferable to winding up as rancor food. Though her own death had almost found her before she'd gotten away, the scything blade of a Gamorrean perimeter guard's pike staff had slashed the raw edge wound on her face. She'd left the blade buried halfway through the guard's throat. Jabba had always made the mistake of hiring thugs who were bigger than they were fast. She'd only felt a fear afterward, 
after she'd stepped over the widening pool of blood, then ran into the desert. In this dimly lit space, she was finally able to stand upright in a central chamber. Where's the other one? She glanced over her shoulder at the two medical droids as they emerged from the tunnel and clicked back into their normal positions. The one you're taking care of. Dengar told us, Shelby's voice snapped silent. Over there, it said grudgingly. The taller droid led Neela past disorganized stacks of weapons and ammunition modules, mixed with the discarded wrappings of auto-thermal field ration containers. It's not really suitable, this patient should have been medevaced to a hospital immediately, but we've done the best we can. Neela tuned out the droid's words. At the low, rounded entrance to the side chamber, she halted and peered inside. Is he... is he awake? A dim glow filled the space. A black cable ran from a shielded work light to a fuel cell power generator in the middle of the main chamber's clutter. Can he see me? Not with what we gave him. Shelby stood just behind her. I prescribed a 5% Oblivion solution from Lexi's anesthetic stocks. On a constant basis, too. The patient's injuries are unusually severe. That was one of the reasons we had to go back to the palace to try and find more. But if we didn't, the pain from this kind of trauma could go into a feedback loop and completely burn out the patient's central nervous system. She stepped into the chamber, ducking under the doorway. An improvised bed, polyfoam stuffed inside flexible freight sheathing, left only a small space between the unconscious man and the medical droid's intravenous units and monitoring equipment. She squeezed past the humming machines, dials, and tiny screens, ticking with slow pulses of light, and stood looking down at someone whose face she'd never seen before. One of her hands reached out to touch him, but stopped a few centimeters away from his brow. He looks worse than I do, thought Neela. The man's flesh looked as raw as it had been when she'd first found him, out in the desert. The skin that he had lost in the Sarlacc's digestive tract was replaced now with a transparent membrane, linked to tubes, trickling fluids from the wall the machines alongside his bed. What's this? She touched the clear substance. It felt cold and slick. Sterile nutrient casing. Shelby reached out and made a slight adjustment to one of the equipment controls. It's what we normally use on severe burn victims when there has been major epidermal loss. When we were in the service of the late job of the hut, we saw and treated a lot of birds. Explosions, said Lexi. Just so. Shelby lifted part of its carapace and in an approximation of a humanoid shrug. The kind of persons who work for Jabba, the rougher sort of his employees, they were always blowing themselves up one way or another. Turnover, high rate. That's true. There were always some we just couldn't put back together. But Lexi did get rather skilled at burn treatment protocols. This individual's somatic trauma, however, is a little different. Shelby scanned over the unconscious figure. No one, as far as can be recalled from our memory banks, has ever survived even temporary ingestion by a Sarlacc. So we're going to do the best we can with what we've got. Neela glanced over at the medical droid. Is he going to live? Hard to tell. An exact prognosis for this patient is difficult to make, due to both the severity and the unusual nature of his injuries. It's not just epidermal loss. Lexi and I have determined that there was also exposure to unknown toxins while he was inside the Sarlacc's gut. We've attempted to counteract the effects of those substances, but the results are uncertain. If we had access to records of other such humanoid Sarlacc encounters, the probability of his survival could be calculated. But we don't. Though, just on a personal basis. Shelby's voice lowered, a simulation of confidentiality. I'm surprised that this individual is still alive at all. Something else must be keeping him going. Something inside him. The droid's words puzzled her. Like what? I don't know, replied Shelby. Some things are not a matter of medical knowledge. 
Not the kind I have, at any rate. She looked back at the figure on the bed. Even like this, with his mere human face exposed and unconscious beneath the machine's care, his presence brought a chilling unease around her own heart. There's something, thought Neela, between us some invisible connection that she had caught the tiniest glimpse of back in Jabba's palace, when she had looked up to the gallery and she had seen this man, unmistakable even when masked, seen him and felt the touch of fear. Not because of what she'd remembered at that moment, but because of what she couldn't remember. If this man stood somewhere in her past, she stood in the shadows, stretching back farther and deeper, than any mere rancor pit. What about Dengar? With another effort of will, Neela brought herself back to the present. Why is he doing this? Taking care of him? I have no idea. Shelby's optic receptors gazed at her blankly. He didn't tell us. When he came to the palace and found us. And frankly, that's not a matter of concern to us. Unimportance, said Lexi. We're programmed to provide medical care. After Jabba the Hutt's death, we were just glad to be provided with an opportunity to do that. That left the other bounty hunter's agenda as a mystery to her. She'd taken the chance when she'd left this one out on the desert islands, where Dengar could find him. She'd been horrified by the extent of his injuries. There would have been no way she could have taken care of the rawly bleeding man. In Jabba's palace, she had seen enough to be aware of the enmity the professional rivalry and personal hatred that existed amongst all bounty hunters. But then, this one would have been no more dead if Dengar had found him, then gone ahead and stood on his throat until he'd stopped moving. Instead, a certain strange sense of relief had stirred in her as she crouched behind an outcropping and had witnessed Dengar examining the injured man. That same inexplicable emotion had risen when she'd followed the medical droids to this hiding place and had found the man still alive. There wasn't time to ponder what that meant. You've been here long enough, she warned herself. Whatever Dengar's motives might be for keeping his rival alive, he might not be so charitably inclined toward her. Bounty hunters were secretive creatures. They had to be in their trade. Dengar might not be happy to find that someone else was aware of not only his hiding place, but what, and who, was inside it. I'm going to leave you now, Neela told the droids. You can carry on with your work. This man must stay alive, do you understand that? We'll do our best, and that's what we're created for. And you're not to tell Dengar anything about me, about my being here at all. But he might ask, said Shelby, whether somebody had been here or not. We're programmed to be truthful. Let's put it this way, Neela leaned her scarred face close to the droid's optics. If you tell Dengar about me, I'll come back here and take you apart. I'll scatter your pieces all across the Dune Sea, both of you, and then you won't be able to do your jobs, will you? Shelby appeared to mull over her statement for only a few seconds. That certainly overrides the truthfulness programming. Silence, interjected Lexi hastily. Completeness. Good. She glanced around the chamber to see if she'd left any telltale sign of her visit. Against the base of the rough-surfaced wall was something she hadn't spotted before. She stepped closer to it and saw that there was a pile of rags, the tattered shreds that she'd found still clinging, wet with the sarlacc's digestive fluids, to the injured man's torso. On top of the pile was another object, not rags, but metal, etched by its time in the beast's gut, but still recognizable. Neela leaned down and picked up the helmet with its unmistakable, narrow, T-shaped visor. That was what she had seen before. In Jabba's palace, the helmet's mask was a cruel, implacable face in itself, the gaze hidden inside as sharp as any cutting blade. Neela grasped the helmet in both hands, holding it before her like a skull or part of a dead machine. Even empty, it looked back at her in silence, and she was afraid. Boba Fett. 
The name sounded in her thoughts, though not spoken by her. That was what he'd been called. She knew that much. She'd heard the name whispered by those who both hated him and dreaded him. You'd better go now, the medical droid's voice broke into her thoughts. It won't be long before Dengar returns. Her hands trembled as she set the helmet back down on the pile of rags. At the chamber's entrance, she stopped and looked back at the figure on the bed. A thread of something almost like pity crept into the knot of fear inside her. She turned and hurried away, toward the slanting tunnel that would lead her to the more comforting darkness outside. There had been voices. He'd heard them, from somewhere on the other side of a blind sea. He supposed, in a still-functioning area of his brain, that was part of dying. In a cortical nexus lying under the weight of pain and blurry not-pain, the remains of his mind and spirit picked over the few scraps of sensory data that impinged upon the living corpse that his body had become. They were like messages from another world, frustratingly incomplete and mysterious. Of all the voices he'd heard, only one had been a woman's. Not the same one as before, which he could remember being addressed as Manaru. He had still been lying out on the desert, vomited up by the Sarlacc, when he'd heard that one. But that had been the past. Now he heard another woman's voice. That was the one that tormented him, that made the sleep of his dying a place where memories rose out of the darkness. His eyelids had fluttered open, or had tried to. They were mired in some pliable substance clinging tightly to his face. As weak as he was, the stuff bound him as tightly as Han Solo had been in the block of carbonite he delivered to Jabba the Hutt. But he'd managed to raise his eyelids just enough, a fraction of a centimetre, that he'd been able to catch an unfocused glimpse of the female. She had been there in Jabba's palace, a simple dancing girl, but he knew she was something more than that, much more. Jabba had called her Neela. That was it. He could remember that much. But that wasn't her real name. Her real name. Fragments of memory touched, then drifted apart, as the effort of vision took him back beneath the lightless weight pressing around him. There, he dreamed without sleeping, died, yet still lived, and remembered. And there we have it, the end of chapter three. So that's quite fascinating. So the character of Neela is really interesting. Neela, another Twi'lek dancing girl from uh, Jabba's palace. I'm really loving how this so far is so dedicated to the aftermath of the death of Jabba and what that does to Tatooine, what it does to the galaxy and the uh, galaxy's criminal underworld in general what it does to all the people who are tied to Jabba, who made the living off of him, who were stuck there, were slaves like Neela was. Also, this implication that Neela had another life before meeting Jabba, and that Jabba has somehow changed her memories, has altered her, hypnotized her. That's really interesting and something that I didn't know was ever a part of like what was happening um, to the dancers at Jabba's uh, palace. Obviously, we see from that famous Rancor scene, and we know um, that they are pretty, they're in a pretty bad place, and they are not there of their own will. Um, certainly, they don't like being there, but not that it was this genetic altering, hiding people thing. And who is this character going to be? Because it does seem that not only that, but that very last bit suggests that Boba knows Neela. So they have some sort of shared past that's going to be really important, I guess, to the rest of this book. And I am so looking forward to finding it out. Uh, if you have any, um, like, theories about what it is, again, if you do know, try and avoid spoilers in the uh, comments so that we can read and enjoy as we are. Um, but this is cool. Also, I mentioned it said we didn't really know how he got out of the Sarlacc pit. It mentioned he was vomited up in that, so... Something happened, so the Sarlacc dying, perhaps, has caused him to be ejected from it. How did it die? Let's see what's confirmed further on in this book, but I really hope you've enjoyed this first episode. Here we are on the day that the Book of Boba was released. So, if you like this, 
give the video a like, please. It really helps us out. And subscribe to us and hit that bell icon so you know when the next video comes out. Guess what? It should be next Wednesday when the next episode of The Book of Boba comes out. Who would have thought? One Book of Boba, two Book of Boba. That's how we work here. Okay. And also, the thing that would really help us the most is that if you like this and you know someone else who loves Star Wars, share this with them. Just say, yo, mate, bruh, listen to this thing. It is for free. Leave them a comment. That's all they want. And then send them to us and we will give a nice, delightful audiobook experience of Star Wars The Mandalorian Armor. And next time, we will be looking into Chapter 4 and beyond. But until then, my friends, have a good time. I will see you on Sunday to talk about the Book of Boba TV show. Let us know what you think. Bye-bye.